Do you ever treat prisoners? So yes. What to do with amnesia patients, hookup rooms in the hospital, and how to skip the line in the ER. What? Today, I am breaking down and answering some of the most wild questions about the emergency department. All right, let's dive right in. How come in the ER they cut off clothes instead of just taking them off? Do they reimburse me for my favorite shirt being cut? Any patient coming into the emergency department needs to be put in a hospital gown so we can make sure that we do a full exam and make sure we're not missing something. In situations where time is of the essence, yes, we do cut off clothes. And no, unfortunately not, that favorite shirt is not reimbursed by the hospital or the insurance company. Have you ever run out to an emergency helicopter to receive a patient? Get to the chopper! Me personally, no. What happens is the helicopter, if it's coming to a hospital, most likely it has a helicopter pad and most of the time it's probably on a roof somewhere. So it wouldn't be advantageous for the doctor to go out there to receive the patient because there's really not much to do during that transport from the helicopter back down to the emergency department where everything that the ER doctor needs is there. What's the most amount of times you could shock a person in the ER? So this person is asking about shocking an individual when they're in cardiac arrest. So what ends up happening is you take many factors into consideration. How long the downtime's been? How long were they without CPR before CPR started? Sometimes there is something called refractory VFib, VTAC. And during those instances, sometimes you use two different machines to try to use even more of energy to try to get somebody into a normal rhythm. So it's on a case by case basis. It's not an exact number. There are times that I can remember where you shock somebody greater than five, 10, 15 times. It just depends in the situation that you're in. Do they really have hookup rooms? I mean, rooms where you can nap at the hospital like on Grey's Anatomy. I don't know anything about hookup rooms, but yes, there are rooms in a hospital where staff can sleep and typically it's doctors that sleep. Now, ER doctors, no. That's typically not something for us because we work in shifts and we basically have people that come in for overnight shifts. The ER never shuts down. Now, if you are an on-call doctor who's a surgeon or an anesthesiologist or an OB GYN, where you have to be at the hospital ready to go, then yes, they have what we call call rooms. And that's where somebody could get a couple hours of some sleep. How many patients do you see on an average shift in the ER? Oh, that's a good question. So it depends on how many hours your ER shift is and again, how busy your emergency department is. But in general, the average ER doctor typically sees around two to 2.25 patients an hour, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So if you average two patients an hour for an eight hour shift, that's 16 patients. My emergency department's a little bit busier, so we would typically see a little bit more per hour. Can you clear up some confusion? Is it ER or ED? What's the difference? ED stands for emergency department and ER stands for emergency room. I don't know if anybody's been to the ER lately, but it's not literally one room. There are many rooms. It is a department. It's the surgical department. It's the medicine department. It is the emergency department. So that is the appropriate word, but historically it's been known as ER. So it's just easier and translates to everybody that we all know what the ER is. If I arrive by ambulance, do I get to skip the line or is it like a fast pass at an amusement park where I still have to wait? So yes, unfortunately, no matter how you arrive to the emergency department, everything is triaged based on emergency medical necessities. It is not first come, first serve. It is who's the sickest, who needs the most amount of treatment quickest. And so in the emergency department, what ends up happening is sometimes the ER is totally full. And so you arrive by an ambulance and you don't need to immediately go to a room and be on a cardiac monitor. They will literally take you off the ambulance stretcher and get you into the lobby of the ER and get things going. Have you ever had to use a household item in a pinch for a medical procedure? Have you or anyone you worked with ever been MacGyver in the ER? Casey, hand me that copper wire. You got it, McGruber. Caleb, that feather. Got your grooves. So yes, it does occur. A lot of times it usually has to do with like engineering equipment, saws or different types of cutting devices. Those are pretty useful in certain situations where you need to cut a screw, cut a, a nail out of somebody, but you don't have a, a medical device to actually cut it. So you need other powerful tools. Do ER doctors ever have to pretend they understand when patients describe their symptoms in very um, creative ways, like interpreting 
toddler talk or using strange descriptors. Yes. Oh, good grief. Sometimes you try to understand what a patient is trying to describe to you and what we'll end up doing is then reiterating it but in our own language to see if it makes sense to what the patient is trying to explain to us. When it comes to foreign language, if you don't speak that language, typically you need a translator. You need an official approved translator. Every hospital has this. It's either by a phone or like an iPad that does video conferencing. It just depends on the language that you need. Do people ever refuse service in the ER? Absolutely all the time, but it's very interesting to us as ER med staff, like that individual has come to us in the emergency department asking for our help and then they refuse care. So sometimes that's interesting to understand, but we don't know what everybody's going through in those moments, or sometimes it's taking too long and they have something to do or somewhere to be. So then you say, okay, it's really not that much of an emergency if something else is taking priority. What's the process for ensuring patient confidentiality? For instance, if a gang member came in as a patient or a victim of domestic abuse, for example. So great question. So the hospital systems have different ways to do this. They will actually not put the person's exact name on the computer system or tracking board. So that way, if somebody were to see the screen, they don't see that. Meaning if you're at a big trauma center, it could be trauma one, trauma two, three, or it can be like a hurricane, how hurricanes are named alphabetically. It could just be a made up alphabetical name. What is ECMO? I've heard it's now being used in emergency departments in certain places. Yeah, so ECMO is not just used in the emergency department, but it's used actually typically more in the ICU. It's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Basically, it's taking the blood out of your body and reoxygenating it and putting it back. Typically, there's two different types. One has to do with using the heart versus one skipping the heart. It just depends on what the problem is. If the heart's a problem, you'll skip the heart. If it's a lung problem, then you don't necessarily need to skip the heart. You just need to get the blood to the lungs. Do you ever treat prisoners? So depending on where your emergency department is, you may be close to a jail or a prison and you treat those individuals. So yes, I work in Southern California and I work near a prison. So we do see prisoners. They have their own med staff in their facility, but if they need higher level of care, imaging done, we'll do that. And obviously if they need to be admitted to a hospital, we'll also try to get them to a contracted hospital. What do movies and TV shows mostly get wrong when it comes to depicting emergency departments in hospitals? I'm trying to set up this saline drip and I can't get this thing to stop beeping. Anyone? It's multifactorial. So say like Grey's Anatomy, you're not having surgical residents just come down and work in the ER randomly. If a surgical resident comes down to the emergency department, they will be there probably for like a month rotation, only focusing on working in the emergency department. Then a lot of the procedures that are actually done on the TV shows aren't that accurate, some are, some aren't, but again, they're doing it on actors, they're not typically doing it on mannequins, and you can't do those things on healthy individuals, like say chest compressions. What happens if a patient comes in and has amnesia, what do you do in that situation? If they don't have a name or family that they can remember? See, I, I suffer from short-term memory loss. If they come in for that primarily, obviously we'll work up a neurologic workout and getting pictures of their brain. We're also looking for toxidromes and infections, a lot of different things. We will continue to do the full care as best we can. Hopefully somebody's looking for them or the police will help try to identify who they are, but our care continues no matter what. How do the ER doctors and staff maintain their emotional and mental health given the high stress, often traumatic nature of their work? So great question. I don't think emergency medicine is for everybody. I think people that get into emergency medicine are able to compartmentalize their emotions and the effects of what they see at work and be able to leave it at work and then go live a normal life at home. I think I do it very well. There are moments when yes, you can have an emotional case, a sad case where it does affect you. For me personally, what do I do? I exercise, I eat healthy, I meditate, I have good friends and family relationships, I have a good spouse that is very supportive of what I do. This was good, good questions. I hope you learned something a little bit about the emergency department, a little bit about me. And if you guys have more questions, throw them at me, please. Also, check out my new supplement company called Life Happens. So if you guys enjoyed this, definitely check out this playlist right here. And as always, please make sure you subscribe, turn your bell notifications on and hit that like button for me. Thank you so much for watching and stay healthy, my friends.